Okay. Uh, in a way, obviously, this is something very different for me. You know, I'm not doing a Renaissance Florence anymore. I'm doing <laughs> literature. But on the other hand, it's very similar in the sense this is based on networks as a sort of hardwired into my genetic structure and and uh, emergence is hardwired into my genetic structure. And this is just uh, the emergence of narrative networks as opposed to Florentine social uh, sort of networks. So I'm very pleased to be packaged with Laurent because I'm trying to, it's, I'm a case study in what he's, uh, he's uh, sort of calling for in a way. Okay, uh, just a little, little bit of background, social network analysis, where I come from, is often criticized for insufficient attention to meaning and history. You know, it's all form, no content, you know, and uh, I'm not going to apologize for that. You get a long way with form and no content. But on the other hand, sooner or later, you have to go back and talk about what's actually happening in these networks and what's, what's going on in these networks. And, uh, you know, in the book with Woody, you know, we, we, we talked about what was going on in these networks more in the category of production. You know, markets, organizations, stuff like that. We didn't talk about it in the sense of conversation, uh, whereas now we had, uh, uh, I want to sort of talk about what's going on in the network in terms of conversation, not just in terms of uh, economic production and uh, sort of political politics. But they all have to do with putting content uh, into uh, sort of networks. Um, but with the advent of textual semantic analysis, this critique needs to be visited. Big data approaches, you know, are all the rage in the social sciences, and they do great things. But you know, I don't think uh, that convinces humanists that much, you know, because they don't you don't get into the fine nitty gritty. The data is sort of too aggregated to sort of get down into the detailed questions that humanists and historians are are answering. So uh, you know, textual analysis is the, all the rage in the social sciences, but it's despised in a history discipline. You know, it's despised. You know, it's despised and, you know, not necessarily in Lorraine, but in most tr traditional uh, literature departments and so forth. It's just because it's too aggregate. You can't really get into the nitty-gritty and the particularities. You mentioned the particularities. It's big data analysis is anti-particularity. So uh, what I wanted to do was try to hold on to the idea of textual semantic analysis but get into the details of what's actually going on. And so this is a case study of a, of a particular <coughs> book by William Faulkner, and I'll explain why I chose that book uh, in a second. But it's all about trying to get down into, be formal, but still networks, 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 all the way down. But on the other hand, the you know particular characters, particular murders, particular suicides, all this sort of stuff is the content of what the network in question uh, is. Okay, that's what the book is, is doing. So that's what I'm illustrating. I want to do, use narrative methodology of narrative networks uh, in order to be a small data analog of the big data topic uh, analysis or approach. Not that I'm opposed to big data, but it doesn't do what the literary and historians want, want to do. Um, okay, this is the question that I am motivated by. Uh, why? Not just as an exercise in methodology, but as an actual question uh, that I want to address, this idea that uh, of biography. You know, biography is, a, I think, a rich concept. It's, it's very much illustrated in this book. It's a biography of a family, not a biography of an individual. Uh, and so it's a so-called Sutpen family. It's this uh, family of uh, poor white trash that came out of West Virginia and moved uh, to uh, Mississippi Delta country and established a big, huge slaves, slave uh, plantation and so forth. So it's a big, it's a, it's a family history, but it's really a micro history of the development of the prebellum South uh, and the Civil War sort of South. Um, but anyway, the, the notion of biography, you know, I, I say history and identity are dual. You know, history, of course, the history of the movement and the creation of this uh, slave plantation and the history of the Sutpen family. Uh, that's what history traditionally conceived. But f you'll see that uh, Florence, I mean, Faulkner uh, sees it also as the formation of identity. Not identity in the sense of the people that did the move, but identity of narrators in 1910 standing back trying to make sense of what their ancestors did. And in particular, why were they so goddamn violent? You know, they're killing each other, they're suiciding each other, they're, you know, terrible people, with slaves and everything. And Faulkner understands this. He's not trying to whitewash slavery or anything like that. He understands it very well, but he wants to understand it as 
the Southerners understand it, you know? And from his point of view, the Southerners understand it by virtue of this. How do I understand my own family's history <laughs> that did all this? Because, you know, 1910, we didn't have slavery. But we still had Jim Crow. So, you know, it hadn't gone away exactly. And what does this imply about who I am and what my future is? Now, the, the, main, the main character uh, or main narrator in this book I'm going to describe is a guy named Quentin Compson. And what it, what, it, what it leads up to is actually suicide. What it leads to is suicide. You know, he is so horrified. <laughs> and, you know, the more he learns, the more he learns, he's so horrified by the whole thing that <sighs> he sees sort of a slavery institution is killing him. Now, of course, he killed him, but he sees it, you know, identity-wise, as slavery uh, sort of ruining him. So that's where this is going at the end of the day. But in any event, um, history is biography viewed from the outside, uh, but Faulkner adds this extra thing that interests me a lot, that identity is, uh, is biography viewed from the inside, from the, not from the people in the Sutton family and, and constructing their own past. This is how they're constructing their identity, subjective uh, sort of identity. So it's this duality. Constructing biography has implications for writing history. Structuring, bio, creating biography has, inter, has it on consequences of self-understanding and, and reflection. It's just it's a duality which I think is interesting from a narrative network point of view. Now, as I alluded to, you may know, uh, Woody Powell and I wrote this book on emergence and so forth. Uh, and it's a big fat book, uh, uh, but it basically took this idea of autocatalysis from chemistry, uh, which uh, on the origins of life literature about uh, wh why did we take that concept? <laughs> because we were interested in novelty, organizational novelty, which was analogous to speciation, which is analogous to the origins of life. And, uh, you know, uh, when you say novelty, Victor's work notwithstanding, mind you, but when you say, when you say novelty, you know, often we're, we're waving our hands without a lot of details about the mechanisms behind it, but the chemists know they've done a lot of work on this subject, and they know a tremendous amount. This is stuff I learned at Santa Institute. But we just tried to extend that to the so social domain, and we came up with three possible applications, production autocatalysis, which leads to the emergence of markets and economy, biographical autocatalysis, which leads to um, networks and organizations. That's all in the book. But we also identified this third mode of linguistic autocatalysis, which is not in the book at all. And that's what this is, from my personal biography's point of view, the purpose of this paper is to try to deliver on that. What is linguistic autocatalysis? You know, this is a my personal question about this. The better big question is identity and history, but my personal question is linguistic autocatalysis. Okay, so this just gives a, a parallel. This is in the book, Agent-Based Models. You have a start with a random, random products and skills. You throw them into a big vat, which I won't explain, a simulation vat, and you know, through reproduction and, and feedback and so forth, it self, sort of self organizes itself into these highly structured networks with positive feedback loops, and that's basically uh, the representation of life. The, the, org the, the network reproduces itself in the face of constant turnover in the components, but they're replaced by new components, and the system basically rebuilds uh, and repairs itself through time. That's, what's the, uh, that's basically the chemistry view of a chemical, simplest, forgetting about genes and stuff, but for the simplest definition of what the life is, it's more like a definition of metabolism, really. Okay, but then, so I want to do an analog. So what's my analog in the linguistic? I want to start with a, f a setup. This is the, what linguistic autocatalysis wants. It wants to start with a, 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 a setup of a bunch of random stuff going on, random experiences, random little factoids about you and your, your past history, and they're not organized into a story. They're just a pile of facts, you know, that have, that have been passed down through oral history or written history or however it's uh, sort of been passed down. And how do you take that random set of facts and turn it into a narrative and turn it into a causal story about A leads to B leads to C leads to suicide? You know, how do you, how do you construct this random stuff into a story? And I'm going to talk about conversation uh, as the mechanism. Conversation is the analog of uh, chemical reproduction, you know, and the, the conversations are basically uh, iterating with each other, and those conversations are going to basically going to turn this, you know, what is a random fact into a narrative 
uh, story, a narrative history. Now this, of course, <coughs> raises the question about whether the narrative is a real history. <laughs> what, what is a real history? This is an interpretive history. This is a history of, of a causal, <coughs> causal inference that you're laying on uh, what may be just random noise. You know, you could take random noise, maybe there is no <laughs> causal connection, you know, but the narrative is going to try to force a causative collection through selective attention and so forth. And they're going to force a causal narrative out of this, and this is what uh, the participants call understanding. Without, you know, you can't understand random noise. <laughs> you have to understand the story, and uh, whether it's true or not, you have to understand that sort of story, and this is the process that Faulkner is going to talk about, about constructing a story, a narrative story, a coherent line out of what is not really coherent <laughs> in its raw sort of data form. Okay, why Faulkner? He mentioned, uh, Laurent mentioned modernism. Well, Faulkner is one of the prime uh, creators of what's called a modernist novel. Marcel Proust, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, you know, this is sort of a, a maybe a narrower definition of, of a sort of modernism. Oh, and, and William Faulkner in his best work, not in all of his work, but in his best, Sound of Fury and Absalom, Absalom. We're, we're the modernists, and what does that mean? Uh, that means that stream of consciousness, they, they write without uh, any omniscient narrator. William Faulkner himself, as an author, does not stand above it and say, you know, this is what's going on, folks. No, that's not the way the book, not, not the way any of these three, four people write. They sort of throw you into the experience, you know, and uh, he, here's what so-and-so is going through. By the way, uh, in his mind, yes, he's going through this in his mind, in his conversations. But, you know, he has this uh, textual way of taking, talking to the dead. What does that mean, talking to the dead? That means flashbacks uh, back to the past where you get, you remember something that your father said. and That's inserted in the middle of a conversation. It's inserted in italics. It'll be, it'll be the voice of the father showing up in the middle of the uh, of the conversation with Duncan, you know. And Duncan, we're having our conversation, but in our minds there's all this stuff going on in the background. So stream of consciousness puts all that together, you know, strings it out. And so when you read a stream of consciousness book, you know, nobody knows what the hell's going on. The people don't know what's going on. The readers don't know what's going on. It takes two or three readings of any of these people to sort of sort it all together because you're, he's forcing you to be thrown into the middle of this experiential chaos and he's trying to get you to un appreciate how much work it takes to turn that into a, a sort of a story. Okay, 10 minutes, I'm about 10% through, you know. But I'll... <laughs> <laughs> <They're too counts. laughs> so anyway, uh, represent, so how, how do I do this with, in a narrative network methodology? First I turned the book uh, into a narrative network. What is a narrative network? Narrative network is here the list of characters. I don't have time to go through the story itself. You might be frustrated that I don't have time to explain the book, but that'll take me an hour and a half to explain the book. Uh, so you've got, you've got a bunch of characters, and I sort of focused in on the things that they cared about. What do they care about? They care about kinship. They care about hatred. They care about murder. They care about suicide. They care about the violence uh, that that's permeates uh, the history of that particular family. So I, I, I code, you know, what various narrators. So here's the characters, and here's the narrators, sort of down here. So you color code uh, the, the the character connections by virtue of who said it, you know, and then you superimpose the who said it by color on top of the what what they're saying, and you you get a, a sense of, of of some things, common knowledge. Some things are shared by everybody, but Faulkner tells the same story over and over and over again from different points of view. And then some things are just idiosyncratic to particular uh, narrators. You know, Rosa. Rosa is fixated on this stuff up here. Nobody else cares about that stuff up there, uh, but she cares. And so whether that's reliable data or not, well, I don't know, not so sure. And, uh, you know, Thompson, he cares about stuff here. And, you know, nobody else cares about this sort of stuff. He's the only source of that sort of information. So is that true or not? Well, you don't really know. It's a reflection of subjective biases. And then you have this conversation that goes on between the main narrator, Quentin, and his Canadian roommate at Harvard, Shreve, who has nothing, knows nothing about the South whatsoever, but nonetheless is sort of engaged in a, 
interpretive conversation to try to help Quentin figure out all this other stuff, and so they come up with their own little story. So you have some, sh some facts that are shared, but seen from different points of view, and you have a, a lot of stuff that's only obsessions of one particular person, you know, how, to, how are you going to fit all that together in, into a, a narrative? And so, uh, what's a narrative anyway? Well, narrative, I say, Aristotle already told us, beginning, middle, and end. It's a, it's a story that has a puzzle at the beginning, an initiation, complication, something happens to the characters which causes trouble, and then it's resolved somehow at the end of the book, often by a transformation in one of, in one of the uh, sort of key characters in question. So it has this sort of small beginning, big middle, end, which I graph like, like that. And this is the, this is the actual episodes in the story that I'm not going to explain, uh, but nonetheless, you can see from the page numbers. Yeah, this one might be a little off, should have been a little higher, but you can see from the page numbers that, you know, the page, the novel itself has that volume of, of discussion, you know, more discussion about the stuff at the middle than the stuff at the end. Okay, let's move on. Uh, my focus is not so much on the story itself, but on the mechanisms through which this sort of random stuff is transformed into this beautiful diagram, you know, which uh, is like, you know, perfectly aesthetic and, and clean, but it didn't start out to be that way. It's just something in the conversational process made it that way. So what are, what are they? And this, I go through that and say, and mapped on the different perspectives into this structure, and this is the Rosa thing. Uh, Rosa's perspective in the context of the big picture She's just focusing on this. And indeed, within that, she talks herself with Quentin on here. And here, this is purple, not red. This is flashbacks, the stuff written in italics that Rosa sticks into Quentin's mind when he's talking to Shreve, you know? So actually, Rosa's perspective is a combination of uh, what she herself says and what Quentin remembers uh, her from sort of saying. Uh, so you, you can see why this is all gets very slippery. You know, this is not like a objective scientific study. This is a sort of a highly interpretive uh, sort of exercise. And this is the other guy, and this is the other guy. Okay, eventually these, these uh, conversations turn into something, you know, like a traditional social network analyst like me would know. You know, you aggregate across all of these perspectives, and you, you get this collection, which Thomas Sutpen, he's the guy, the sort of super uber racist guy who goes to and sets up the slave plantation is at the center, and he's the source. He's the founder of this discipline that's so that this lineage that's so violent. And you got all these guys around here. You know, he's he kills him, and she kills him, and he kills him, and they commit suicide. You know, all these all these slash lines are these sort of violent activities that happen. Here's a, here's a network tie. There's a network tie. That's what the novel is uh, basically trying to understand. Why is there so much? Uh, uh, now, but in the background, of course, by the way, there's misogyny. What's misogyny? It means white masters sleeping with black slaves. It doesn't mean the white master likes the black slaves, but it produces a lot of mixed race kids. <laughs> and so these mixed race kids are these sort of a, uh, Mary Douglas purity and danger type uh, so, sort of people that are, uh, you know, threatening the system because it introduces a contradiction between the simple white black distinction and a more subtle father-son, father-daughter distinction. You know, these two things do not uh, sort of fit together, and they're the ultimate source of all of this uh, self-immolation. He believes Southern slavery was doomed by this self-immolation self within families. Okay, now this is a very complicated thing about, I connect this to times, multiple times, and, uh, you know, I, I had one minute left or five minutes left, so there's no way. But in any event, you can, you, you can, you can turn to narratology theorists who've done a great job of trying to identify, like, what, what is the inside structure of, uh, of telling a story in a narrative? And she show, show, shows that there's a layering. You know, there's actors that are doing things. There's observers that observe the action. There's focalizers or interpreters that, uh, you know, are doing it, there's a narrator that's assembling all of these things. There are different levels 
of telling the story. All the way it goes from chaos down to here up to the beautiful story of here. But she puts in a couple of intervening steps which uh, imply that you can assemble the same data in different sequences. You know, so there's, there, there's a narrator sequence, there's a phenomenological sequence, there's a epistemological sequence. So different histories mean that diff different ones of these roles assemble the same facts in different orders. And so they give different uh, impressions of what is uh, causality. I make a, a case in my paper that uh, Faulkner is more of a, uh, more of a, th a theorist of, of social causality than we give him credit for, and that's because he has these multiple uh, sequences, multiple ways of, think of thinking about causality that he's trying to sort of weave together at once. Okay, so I'm going, I'll skip that. You have more time. These are two measures of time. Oh, I do? Oh, I, I don't have to take 20 minutes <laughs> too seriously? Okay, well then put away those things. <laughs> I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in any event, there's, uh, I, I, draw, I make, with reference to some, uh, not exactly contemporary, I think 10-year-old uh, studies of uh, neuro, uh, bi neurobiology, neuroscience of memory, and I just, I just made some connections between, you know, what, uh, what, what Faulkner said was the different types of time, that is the different ways of sequencing uh, sort of history, and what neurobiologists have said about uh, memory, and, it, and it's not a perfect relationship, but there's a pretty close relationship, actually, that, you know, phenomenological time is, is located in, in the, you know, sort of the reptile, reptilian part of the brain down in the, down in the stem. And uh, there's an emotional memory, which is not really sequence, but just this reminds me of this, this reminds me of this, you know, at, at emotion-driven, basically, it's just... There's a famous first chapter in The Sound and Fury about Benji, uh, a sort of a three-year-old in a 32-year-old body who has, you know, we would call him, used to call him retarded. You're not used to use that language anymore, but, you know, mentally impaired and how Benji sees the world. He got his Nobel Prize based on writing this uh, work about uh, how, how, how a uh, mentally impaired person sees the world. And he sees the world in this sort of, there's no past, no future. It's all collapsed down into the present, you know, and that's what's going to happen at Quentin in the end. This is ultimately what, why he kills himself. All this history is going to come whoosh, down into the present. And, you know, he sees all these uh, murders and things right now, you know, emotionally, just like Benji did. Uh, and so that's, uh, there is a connection between the neuroscience or, or coincidence, let's say, not coincidence, a coincidence between neuroscience, talk about memory, and Faulkner's uh, intuitive sense of, of how people reconstruct stories. Okay, now how's it done? This is my conclusion. Basically, I four steps to turning random noise, random factoids into beautiful narratives, uh, artificial or not. You know, there's, there's individual memories, the roses and so forth that, that do things, and the main thing to say about that is at the individual memory level, I talk about grooving and forgetting. You know, people go back to the same emotional episodes over and over and over again. You know, in my case, I've at least gone through enough uh, psychoanalysis to be comfortable in revealing that my mother, own mother committed suicide. That's part of my interest in this book, you know. And so you go back, I go back to my mind. Mother, 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 Sue, why did she do this? Why did, you know, so there's this, there's this grooving, uh, but at the same time, that leads to forgetting stuff that's off the main track from whatever happened to me in my life that's not descended from my mother, I forget it, not so important. You know, so it's individual memories do this grooving and forgetting process, but at the same time, that makes it hard for your grooving to fit in with my grooving, because you, know, you, you don't have a mother who commits suicide, so you know, how are we gonna talk? You know, this is, constructing a narrative has this challenge because it's built on individual memories. Taking the perspective of alters, this is where conversation comes in, Step two, towards this beautiful thing, I have to force myself, out of myself, find out what the hell Paul's obsessions are, you know? And to sit down and, what? I don't want to understand. Can you say, Morgan, say, you know, draw, draw you out and try to reconstruct consciously the perspectives of others. That's going to be give you the raw material to pool across these difficult to pool sort of processes. 
symmetry and resonance, these are artistic principles. You know, symmetry is uh, taking key, key fact, facts in the system and finding a, a matrix, a two by two matrix, in which all the, all the other cells are filled in. That's what the basis of white, quote unquote black, I say quote unquote black because of mixed race stuff, and the illegitimate, legitimate, these are the sort of the results of compositionality, and that's where this layout scheme uh, so, sort of comes from uh, in my mind. So that's an important step. You don't move to an artistic level unless you find some spatial layout, the diagram called cognitive space, uh, and Faulkner says compositionality is that. And then there's something called uh, recursion and resonance. This is where the same micro interactions, in my case triads, are resonant. What does that mean in my case? That means that I, I take key uh, triads in the novel and I find that they're all imbalanced. You know, balance theory, plus, 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 minus. They're all imbalanced, which means emotionally speaking, you're always burning your teeth. Every damn thing you run into is a contradiction and conflict, you know, all throughout the whole thing. <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a resonance of a, of a contra con conf emotional con conflict, emotional contradiction. And so constructing these resonances uh, is, is a way of, another way of imposing artistic order on, on this sort of principle. So Faulkner's own way of saying this, what's the problem? We see dimly the people, the people in whose blood, living blood and seed, we lay ourselves dormant and waiting. In other words, this is Quentin speaking about Thomas Sutpen back there. <laughs> yes, Judith, Bond, Henry, Sutpen, all of them, they are all there. And yet something is missing. They're like a chemical formula exhumed along with letters from that forgotten chest, carefully, letter, the paper old and faded, falling to pieces. Um, uh, you bring them together again and again, nothing happens. Just the words, the symbols, the shapes themselves showy, inscrutable, and screen against the turgid background of horrible and bloody mischancing of affairs. That's a narrative network that has not been assembled into a, na a narrative yet, you know? That's the, best, that's the raw material uh, out of which, uh, of which he's working. You know, the whole thing adds up to basically chaos and disorder and not understanding. You have to impose, or he claims, you, people impose, maybe an artificial, but nonetheless impose a sense of causal order onto this reality. Um, and so the solution, yet the talking, the seem to him seem to partake of that logic and reason flouting quality of a dream, that's, that's a phenomenological time, uh, depends completely upon a formal recognition and acceptance of elapsed, and yet, uh, elapsing time as music or a printed page. So he's saying artistic principles are, this is what a narrator does, not, not what an interpreter or focalizer does, not what an observer does, certainly not what actors do, but with the narrator trying to put things together, you know, uh, you would say that's Faulkner himself, but in his, the way he writes it, it's this Quentin guy, the way he puts things together, depend upon this sort of artistic uh, sort of sensibility, you know? And uh, this artistic sensibility, I argue, just fits as much into uh, John, science as politics. This is the perfect spot to uh, perhaps let Laurent make his comment. Excellent, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. I will try this great. Uh, relatively short. Um, first thing I would, I would notice uh, is that in, in the humanities, especially in the, in the study of literature, you, you see uh, ebbs and flows, I mean, the recurring idea that maybe we could do something with some kind of uh, transdisciplinary transfer. So late 19th century, you, you have a few people in the system trying to make use of the theory of evolution to uh, explain literary texts in the sense of the evolution of literary genres, for instance. So it goes on. I mean, I.A. Richards, the creator of the phrase close reading for literature, was very influenced by uh, Ramon E. Cajal's uh, drawings of new roles. In the last 20 years, unfortunately, some of the exchange we, we saw was not so convincing. Uh, for instance, we had a sort of big data approach uh, represented by uh, people who are working at Stanford, especially, trying to make the case that distance reading would be best. So you would put all the, the titles of hundreds of books, you would ask the computer, is there a trend? And the computer would find a trend. And then you would say, 
now you no longer need to read the novels because thanks to the computer you have. So what, what I appreciate with what you do is that you, you want to make use of a science-based method that still relies to, uh, on, on the specificities and the particularities of not only the text of the narrative but also the poetics itself. So that, that's better than most of what I've seen coming, especially from the humanistic side with an influence of the, of the sciences. Um, uh, because there is this attention to uh, the stratified textuality, I would say. Uh, so on this, I have two main questions just to begin the conversation that I know will not be extremely long, but still. Uh, so one is uh, about the uh, your link between uh, your emphasis on modernis uh, modernism. Uh, if, if we believe in something like modernism in literature, uh, it seems to me that a, a very common trait that you have is uh, drawing back to what Arthur Rimbaud, for instance, is saying uh, in the late uh, 19th century, je est un autre, I is another. And you all often have within modernist literature the idea that there is no encapsulated self, that the self is always open. And so the first question I have for you is the relation you make between this sort of multiplicity of the self within oneself and what you uh, do with the terms of with the term identity and the the second question is uh, on your representation of <coughs> autocatalysis you you have the stream of consciousness that gives way to uh, a narrative uh, a narrative time and in the text uh, you you mentioned especially in Faulkner you have streams of consciousness as well but do you make any difference between stream of consciousness as a concept, as, as James, uh, uh, the psychologist, uh, created it, which would be a way to explain what is happening in the buzzing world, uh, as he says, of the mind, and stream of consciousness as a literary technique? Because as a literary technique, it's still a reorganization, an aesthetic project on a concept that is largely psychological. And so do we have the same... This, the same kind of uh, autocatalysis when we move from the stream of consciousness we would be immersed in as individuals up to the narrative representation we have of ourselves and the stream of consciousness literary technique that has been transformed already and the narrative time that we see there. Okay, well, on the first uh, question about um, <coughs> multiple selves, open selves, uh, you know, th this is very much in that that modernist project of uh, there is no unitary yes. self in any of these things. But the way I uh, operationalize that is through biography. There's one, no unitary self because there's, everybody's embedded in multiple biographies, actually. Now, one of them they're, they're obsessed with and they remember to the extent that they narrow the, all their life forces down into that one line, then they turn into a little bit more like a <coughs> unitary actor. But when you look at all of the biography, all of the causal lines, including the ones that are forgotten, you know, people are having biography, 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 biography. And so multiple selves in this context are open because they, uh, they have this overlapping biography structure. And Paul's biography and my biography is not the same if we focus on our obsessional uh, starting points, but if we focus on Harrison White and blah blah blah, you know, there's just all this overlapping link. So what is what is my biography is linked to his biography, and so you know what happens in his biography affects me. So in the world of forgetting, not just the world, obsessional world of linear uh, simplification, reductionism, if you will, you know, it's it's all open, and so it's very modernist. Faulkner is a modernist, and this is what he means by that, you know, he means this overlapping biography sort of stuff. And uh, uh, what's the second question again? Uh, if you make any difference between the stream of consciousness as a uh, categorical description of what would go on in our mind and the stream of consciousness as a literary technique. Oh, well, I, I, I don't know whether I do, but you know, what Faulkner does is simply, you know, he, he writes as if, you know, there is no self. It's just a sort of a open window, stuff's coming in, you know, phenomenologically. It's not organized, it's all present. It could be emo emotional associations, but it's highly uh, sort of disorganized. That's what he sort of... But let's he, say that from the psychological viewpoint, the question would be, is it the same kind of stream? When we have a representation of the stream of consciousness in Faulkner or in Joyce, is it the kind of stream of consciousness we have in, in the mind of an individual? 
or is it a very different way of... No, I mean, he, he, Faulkner, I can't speak as much to Joyce, but he's, of course, it's different because it's written by Faulkner. It's not the actual mind. But nonetheless, Faulkner is trying very hard to simulate that, you know. Faulkner is trying to obliterate that distinction. He's trying to pretend that he is accurately capturing what is actually happening. So for your analysis, it's the same? I mean, From my point of view, it's the same. Speaking. From my point of view, it's the same because Faulkner is trying to make it the same. Yeah. Okay, Delia. Um, this may actually be the type of question you hate. So how do you, do you see like your uh, intuition of the potential of multifocality change from like your, your original work on the magnitude to, to this use of multifocality? Because in that case, like what for instance fascinated me and is one of the things I use the most is this idea that individuals might actually find themselves like playing different games, not necessarily super consciously, but at some point they take advantage of the fact that they had been sent in a senior yeah. Well, here it's really like a composition of different narrations that, yes, okay, at some point like combine and crash the individual, but like the narrations themselves don't have that ambiguity that life, uh, they are kind of flat, it's just the overlap. Yeah. Well, the original multivocality and robust action was based on attribution. Right. You know, Cosimo, Cosimo's identity had nothing to do with his brain. I call him a sphinx. So as far as I'm concerned, he has no brain. You know, he's only what, what other people construct him as. It's just that he's in a certain network, which you have five groups that construct him as different things. And that gives him a lot of uh, freedom and mobility to sort of maneuver among these groups as opportunity arises. So uh, multivocality in that case is coming from the outside attribution. You know, multivocality in this case is more moving inside the brain, not, not just closing off the brain like I did with Cosimo, but moving inside the brain and the mind. But then again, it goes to this open question, the, what is the mind? Well, the mind is all these multiple uh, outside voices in the first place, you know? So you just take these outside voices, put them inside the mind, and you've got multivocality created within the cranium rather than just uh, outside. <clears throat>
sociology and literature. And he, one of the books he taught was uh, Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, <laughs> which I think is rich with yeah. this type of material. Yeah, he's, some people consider him a modernist also. Yeah. And so the, what the challenge that you're posing is that literature can be subject to the same methodology of modern network analysis and that one can come up with universal conceptions of mechanisms uh, that apply to explaining the process and the social interactions that are portrayed by one novel or maybe novels by Faulkner. So that is a very revolutionary idea, it seems to me, that literature is a source of social behavior data. But, uh, you know, to take the other side, you know, I, I think this is what I take pride in. I'm a social scientist, not a literary scholar after all. But then I have to reveal uh, my dirty linen that I, I tried to present this paper at the Faulkner Conference in Oxford, Mississippi. They rejected it. <laughs> they well, we accepted it. <laughs> they accepted it. We didn't reject it for publication. We rejected it from even being presented. <laughs> so so I, I wasn't too convincing on the other side, apparently. Uh, Duncan. So <clears throat> one more question, then we take a 20, oh, uh, two, 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 two more questions. Take a 20 minute break. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. As a, I'm curious, like as a, you know, I'm curious, like what this has to say to to social science methodology, because I think I'm being fair that when social scientists, you know, when we talk about explaining things, like we actually imagine that what we're doing is is finding, if not the truth, then at least we have some sort of method for. Uh, extracting something that is reliable and generalizable and causal, etc. What you're describing here is that the the narrative, the explanation, is essentially like a creative act, like a, a generative uh, act that we are imposing, as you mentioned. We and we can do it on thing on totally random noise, but there doesn't have to be any true mechanism there for us to come up with a story that sounds totally reasonable to us. Um, and, and gives us meaning and all of these things. So I guess the, the concern I have is like, if, is that what we're doing when we like, you know, when we analyze history or when we, you know, analyze data? You know, we're, are we are we essentially like imposing, you know, uh, 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 you know, generating narratives out of data and acting as if we've done something scientific when in fact what we've really done is just told a very convincing. Well, I, my short answer is yes, that's what we're doing. Uh, but, uh, but of course, it, even in Faulkner, even in this case, this is done not without constraints. Mm -hmm. You know, he has to fit all of that raw data into the final uh, sort of narrative. He's not allowed to throw away missing data or any, any more than we are. So, you know, it's constrained by being consistent with all the data that we have. But is it, but is it a creative act? Yes, it's a creative act, but under the constraints of being consistent with the data that you have. And that's that's not uh, quite the level of what you're 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 asking, but that's what he would say. Right, and, and actually, um, I teach a class on explanation in social science, and, and we just read a book by John Lewis Gaddis uh, about history and what historians do, and it actually sounds very similar. And, they, and he also sort of brings up this point about how well historians tell stories, but they have constraints. But I think if we've learned anything over the last decade. In the sort of credibility crisis in in you know psychology and social science is that the constraints are not nearly as constraining as we thought they were right that there's like enormous potential and flexibility to tell many different stories for the same set of constraints and, uh, and so, yeah but you've you've heard of you've heard of the identifiability problem in statistics same thing in statistics. Different models can fit the same data to the same R squared, you know. And this is this was always a debate between Simon and Milton Friedman all the time. You know, my behavioral rea rationality can fit the data, and Milton would come along and say, my rational choice can fit the data. Well, they're both right because you know it's a uh, it's not like the world is composed of critical tests that sharply uh, sort of distinguish these things. The world is composed of a lot of overlap, actually, even the sign hardcore scientific world. So I, I would come back and support the original point, you know, that it's, uh, and I guess Gaddis's point also. Yes, it's a uh, it's creative act. 
For sure, that's what we call, they call it an interpretation, we call it a theory, same thing. You know, it's a creative act. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, they're both constrained I by... I I'm not sure that, that most social scientists think that that's what they're doing when they come up with theories. I don't think we could have... <laughs> like, well, it's just a story, uh, don't take it too seriously. So this seems like a perfect point to stop. <laughs>